Our next speaker is Dawn Edge, and Dawn is Professor of Mental Health and Inclusivity at the University of Manchester. She's also Academic Lead for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion on Race, Religion and Belief, and she's a member of the Health Foundation um, within, uh, within Greater Manchester Mental Health NHS Trust. And she's also served as a non-executive director of NHS Mental Health Trusts and on the board of trustees of community organisations that work with marginalised communities. And she's very prolific in terms of her research and her <laughs> academic writing. And I feel very proud to be able to call Dawn my friend. So... Uh, <laughs> So hello everyone. Um, so just to clarify, I'm, I'm actually um, a, a governor for the Health Foundation, which is a national body, um, but I'm also um, a director of an equality, diverse, diversity and inclusion uh, research unit that we're establishing within Greater Manchester Mental Health. Um, and as Jenny says, I'm Professor of Mental Health and Inclusivity at the University of Manchester, and it's a real privilege to be here, and you're doing so well staying awake after that big lunch. So hope, hopefully I won't send you to sleep. So this is what I'm going to talk about, a bit about some of the stuff actually we've already heard. So there's a lot of intersection you'll see between what we've talked about and we will talk about for the rest of the day. So really about some of the stuff that we know and what we don't know. Um, looking at the interrelationship between physical and mental health and our help seeking and help getting. And really, we don't have a huge amount of time, so I'm looking forward to talking with you over, over coffee break and then maybe later on because uh, I think that's where a lot of the great stuff's going to happen. So just to kind of get us all on the same page, the World Health Organization defines mental health as a state of well-being in which every individual realizes their own potential and can cope with the normal stresses of life, can work productively and fruitfully, and is able to make a contribution to their community or communities. I just really wanted to pause then. You see, I've highlighted the normal stresses of life in the context of why we're here, to think about what that looks like for black women and how we've normalized things that are not normal in order to be able to cope. So the fact that, you know, certainly as a black woman and a mother, you know, whenever my son goes out, I worry. You know, we, we, I, when, we, when George Floyd was murdered, the thing that I kept hearing from so many black women was about being tired. And I think because we were all a bit on pause because of COVID, many of us began to realise the weight of the burden that we carried, not just for our own selves and our day-to-day -day experiences of, of racism and being racialized, but also that we carried for other family members and particularly our males. So just really wanted to maybe pick up on that at some other point. But in terms of the focus of, of, of what I'm going to talk about, just a bit of a backdrop, and some of you will be really well familiar with this, but in the UK, um, black people, so people of African, Caribbean, black African, and mixed and multiple heritage, are at significantly greater risk of being diagnosed with serious mental illnesses. So things like psychosis, um, much less likely to have formal diagnoses with what are called common mental disorders like anxiety and depression. But as you heard from this morning, and as you'll see later on in my talk, it doesn't mean that people aren't affected. It just means that somehow we don't get the diagnosis. And alongside that overrepresentation at the more coercive end of psychiatry, um, what we have are more negative experiences of access. So I'll just put these all up. So much more likely to um, enter mental health services, be hospitalized, to come into hospital, under sections of the Mental Health Act, so under blue light with a police escort, rather than more benign routes like going through your GP. And when we do enter services, much more likely to, be, to receive coercive care, so held in seclusion, forcibly restrained, higher doses of psychotropic medication, and higher risk actually of dying um, as a result of those control and restraint techniques. Less access to psychological therapy, and on average, we stay in inpatient psychiatric care about two and a half times longer than a white British person. So paradoxically, our care is much, much more expensive, but much worse. So I'm not quite sure why that's come up there. Let me just put them all up here. So um, as you've heard already, there's a lack of research. And that lack of research partly is to do with intersectionality, which I know Jenny's going to talk about later on, so I won't, won't go there. But 
in the UK, when people talk about ethnicity and mental health research, there's often a kind of binary position. So the focus is either on black men and the kind of big black and dangerous um, ethos and, and psychosis, or South Asian women and being passive and docile and depression. So black women who are often seen as being aggressive, if not assertive, um, don't really fit the docile model. And because of the, so much of the focus is on, that, is on dangerousness, we don't really, they don't really talk about us in psychosis. But actually, the rates of diagnosis with psychosis for, women, for black women is not that dissimilar for black men. It's just that it's just not talked about in the same way. Um, so we face um, disparities in accessing care, as I've already mentioned, and also the, the way where we end up in care. So we're much more likely to, be, uh, to end up in inpatient units for similar kinds of conditions for which white women wouldn't. And we are much more likely, much less likely to be offered nice recommended, so policy recommended um, forms of care, particularly around psychological therapies. And the psychological therapies that we do receive are rarely culturally informed. Um, so we won't have t time to talk about some of the work that I'm leading at the moment. So I've got a, a study, I've, I've got um, a QR code if you want to find out a bit more about that, around culturally adapted family intervention for people with psychosis. So um, as Jenny mentioned earlier this morning, so she asked me to talk about is some of my earlier work, which is around my doctoral research around perinatal depression. And it just seems odd that we should still be talking about this. But in actual fact, it's because so much, not that much more has been done. So there are few people who are doing a bit more work around this area. But what I found was about a quarter of black women, so these were women of Caribbean origin um, that, was, that I screened for depressive symptoms, were, um, were screened at rates that were high enough to suggest that they had treatable depression, but very few of them had ever received any kind of medical or psychological intervention. And comparing that with people in Jamaica, so we had um, some, some colleagues of mine at the University of the West Indies, and they found a similar um, prevalence rate of depressive symptoms overall. But what they actually found was that in the last trimester of pregnancy, about half the women had significant levels of depression and anxiety that was, was not treated. And that's important because actually we know that maternal depression has really important implications, not just for a child, not just for the woman, but also for her unborn child, that it predisposes the, the then fetus, the baby, and then going on to, to develop other things like cardiovascular disorders, so, you know, the, the, obviously the mum and the baby are sharing the same blood, all the same hormones that are being released. And there's really good evidence that maternal stress, maternal depression, predisposes the child to worse physical and indeed mental health later on. And just picking up on um, what was, always, was said this morning with the five times more, um, was about professionals. So, what I interviewed healthcare professionals to find out what they thought might account for why so few black women um, who were in touch with, mental, with, um, with maternity services. So I recruited women through the local maternity hospital. So these are not women who were missing from the system. They were women who were in touch with services, but were not, their depression was not being picked up. They were not having it. Nobody was asking them about how they felt. Um, and so when I asked people, about health professionals, why they thought that might be, a black, actually this was a black woman GP who said, well, they must be managing it because actually black women don't really kill themselves. So that's taken to be the kind of marker <laughs> that actually they must be doing all right because we're not seeing them amongst suicide rates. But as we heard this morning, that's not actually true. And we do know that suicide is the leading cause of maternal deaths in the UK. And we know that more maternal mortality is four times higher for black women. But what we haven't done is to kind of disaggregate some of that data. And there's still, as you heard again this morning, or earlier this afternoon, there's still um, a belief, very mistakenly, within services that black women don't self-harm. We don't, we don't do that. And maybe it also exists amongst some of us, but that's not the case. And I just want to move on to talk a little bit now about the relationship between physical and mental health. So again, as you heard this morning with, the, with lupus, so there are some conditions that we know have um, bring with them 
a higher risk of depression in particular. So things like lupus, which we know disproportionately affects black women, about three times more um, than the rate amongst white women. Fibroids, um, black women tend to get them at a younger age, they tend to be bigger, um, and they um, we are much more likely then to end up being hospitalized and actually to have hysterectomies being offered as the first line of treatment. And so very young women having, having hysterectomies. But not much research about black women's physical health and mental health and how that plays out and how women cope with those things. And we heard about um, you know, menstrual problems and about how people are not necessarily having conversations about that, but women are losing time at work. And you know that if you miss too, so much time off work, then you're onto disciplinaries. And then that obviously is going to worsen your mental health. So there's this real kind of under, under the radar issue around mental health, particularly for common mental health disorders. And this is a slide from the same, what used to be called the Sanger Centre for Mental Health, now the Centre for, for Mental Health. And you'll see in the green, the green side um, of the slide that people with long-term conditions, so things like lupus, um, about a third of the population, affect about a third of the UK population, so a whole range of long-term conditions. And mental health problems affect about 20%, so about a fifth of us will have mental health difficulties at some point along our lifetime. And where you see where those two things intersect, you'll see that about a third of people with long-term conditions also have a mental health difficulty. And almost half of the people with mental health problems have long-term physical conditions. Okay, so that's about five million people. And one of the things that's been said about us when we're talking about barriers to getting help is that very often, um, and so it was a really important point by the last speaker, about, and earlier on that we heard um, from Chloe and, and Tunde, where we're talking about very often black people are seen as being, um, we are mistrustful of, mental, of research for really good reasons, um, but actually we're prepared to go beyond the mistrust to get involved because we think it matters. And it was really interesting when I was doing my, my, my um, collecting data for my PhD, how many people approached me to say, how have you managed to get black women to get, take part in your study because we can't get them? So... And that's not, that doesn't sound like it's changed very much. But actually, it's not that we have, we, we, we may be distrustful of the system, but it's not that we have negative attitudes to research per se. It's the kind of research that's being done and who's doing it. That is, that is one of the issues. But there are some other things. We've got some structural barriers. So some people, sometimes we're not asked. But then, you see, I grew up in a Jamaican family, and this was a mantra, you don't talk your business. So the idea that you would talk particularly about things around your family. So it may be okay to talk about yourself, but to talk about family matters is another matter altogether. Um, stigma, we know is universal. Stigma happens across all communities, but there are some partic particular issues in racialized commu and minoritized communities. And so some of that is about, um, you know, like again, thing from Jamaica, you know, where I come from, we don't have grades of mental health difficulties. We just have madness. If you've got any kind of mental illness, you're just mad, right? That's just, there's no gradation. Um, so, um, what that means is that for some communities where actually that has really profound implications, not just for the individual, but for their entire family. So within some families, if there's seen to be any kind of mental health difficulty with your family, that has implications for people's marriageability. So if you're mad, then who's going to want to marry your, mad, your sister? Because she might end up the same way, right? Um, and then we also have this, that was already mentioned this morning, you know, the strong black woman myth reality. Maybe we'll talk about that too. Um, but what that does is that the idea that we can keep going no matter what, we keep pushing forward, we keep, we keep going, we're looking after ourselves, we're looking after, we're doing all this other stuff. Um, and this, these are a couple of quotes from people in, uh, that I interviewed as part of my, my PhD. So we had um, this, this young woman that talked about black women, it's not that we don't get depression, which means just talking about depressive symptoms. So she says, I don't think it's that black, I do think that black people get depression, but I don't think we're allowed to have depression. So it's not that you don't get the symptoms, you don't have the feelings, but you're not allowed to own it. Okay? And then also this thing about being quite a matriarchal society, and so that's this business about having to cope. 
So one of the first papers I wrote for my PhD was actually called Dealing With It, which is a quote from one of the women when I asked about, because she told me all these things that she was going through. And I said, how do you do all that? And she said, you just have to deal with it. And that's kind of a mantra. And then this other one, which is people then linked their own experience and kind of looked at it through a lens that took them way back. So this, this is the youngest woman in my study um, who talked about it goes way back to slavery, where you had to be strong. You had to be strong for your kids. We had to protect them. We had to be strong for them. And we couldn't show how we were really feeling inside. So we have, to, we have to be the ones who hold it together. And what these women went on to talk about is, is kind of what we now often call um, generational transmission. <laughs> So they talked about their mums and seeing their mums having to manage, seeing their grandmothers and other women in their families or in their communities. And then they kind of assess their own situation and were going, actually, in comparison to those women, I've got it quite easy. So I don't really, I don't really meet the threshold for saying I'm depressed. If they could keep going, then so should I. And people talk, one of the things that I asked um, both black and white women was about sources of help and support. And oh, interestingly, only the black women talked about spirituality as a source of, of support and managing their uh, any kind of emotional, psychological difficulties. And people talked about going to church. Even people who were not churchgoers talked about, you know, I know that if I went to the local black majority church, so-called, there was some wise woman there that would be able to help me. And women who didn't actually go to church kind of held on to that as a, as a means of helping to preserve their health and well-being. But as you see from this image in the middle, the woman in the middle with her baby on her back and her arms outstretched, and I think that epitomizes a lot of us. So we're looking after people all around us. We're looking after the older person on one side. We're looking after our, or maybe our siblings, our own children, alongside holding down a full-time job. If we're in faith-based organisations, often we have leadership positions. Sometimes they're not very well recognised. We're doing pastoral care. And, we're, and often we're also studying alongside. So it's in that sense, it can become a bit of a double-edged sword. So that sisterhood, the idea that we look after ourselves, we look after each other is great, looking after each other, but then who's looking after you? Who's, who's caring for the carer? And just to pick up on some of the things about gaps in research. So one of the things we really, really don't know is the true extent of black women's mental health difficulties. And I'm not necessarily just talking about psychosis. So those kind of very florid conditions tend to come to the fore because of the manifestation of them, right? People are hearing voices and other things that are going on, which mean that really affect their ability to function. But we know that lots of us with depressive symptoms, quite marked levels of depressive symptoms, drag ourselves to work. We get the kids to school. We get meals on the table. We do all of that stuff, but we're struggling, okay? And so I just really wanted to question this notion of resilience with, with black women and just ask ourselves to really reflect on the extent to which we really bounce back. So one of the metaphors that came from, my, um, from the data I collected with women, I talked about rubber band women. That's why I label some of the women in my study. So, you know, if you think about a rubber band and you kind of play with it, I used to do that as a kid, and it, it looks like it goes back to its original size and shape, doesn't it? It looks like it always goes back. But actually, every time you stretch that band, it's a bit damaged. It's imperceptibly damaged. And at some point, it snaps. And the thing is, you don't quite know where that's going to happen. So I think it's really important for us to question that. And some colleagues in Michigan, so uh, Professor James Jackson in particular, did some work where they looked, began to, to theorise what he called the consequential trade-off of people, of black people, not ending up with diagnoses for common mental health difficulties like anxiety and depression, but being massively overrepresented with stress-related illnesses, particularly cardiovascular dis disorders and endocrine disorders that may be linked to the work that we're, the extra work that we're having to do to manage symptoms ourselves and get on with everyday life and that coping. I think in that context as well, just going back to the, um, Sunday and Chloe's presentation about was it 80 something percent of people who didn't have any mental health difficulties. And I think it's sometimes it's worth our while thinking about that. So why, why is it that some of us are doing okay? What is it that keeps us doing okay 
when we're experiencing real difficulties? And what can we learn from older women and from younger women about coping strategies that can help us to move from surviving to thriving? Again, the research, we really need to do more about black women's physical and mental health. And then also how we can create interventions and support systems that really help women without doing further harm. So in terms of take homes, we definitely need more research, but we need different kinds of research, more inclusive research. So we've heard about, um, you know, in terms of five times more, how important it is to hear women's voices. But, uh, you know, there's a thing in research called the, um, the hierarchy of evidence with things like randomized control trials at the top. Qualitative research, talking to people, doesn't even feature on the hierarchy. Okay, so in terms of getting your research funded, it's not so easy. Then getting that research published, it's better now than it used to be, but getting qualitative research published in really high impact journals, which is one of the things that matters for academic careers, is still not that easy. Better than it was, un undoubtedly. But more importantly, the people who are doing the research. So we need people, a whole range of different people, to do different kinds of research. So when I started to want to do research around black women, people were going, well, why, why do you want to talk about black Caribbean women? They're, you know, they're, they, don't, they don't, don't have language barriers. They don't have, you know, like, okay. So, so that's, the, that's the kind of, if, it's, if, if they can speak English, then that's okay then. We don't have to look at any other cultural differences. Yeah. So definitely the kind of questions that some of us in this room will ask will differ from questions that are more, if you like, traditional research questions. And the methods that we want to use to examine them will also be different. We've heard a lot today about activism, advocacy and support. And again, about using that research, using the current evidence and the lack of evidence to really advocate for different kinds of research, to push funders, whether it's Wellcome Trust, we're doing much better, or National Institute for Health Research, DISO doing much better, but there are some other groups, some of the funders, maybe not so much. And it's about how we use that evidence to advocate for us getting more funding to do the kind of research that's necessary. And just um, a final take home for me, and it's a bit of a note to self as well, is just to remember the importance of looking after our own selves and our own well-being. And, you know, as Audre Lorde says, you know, it's, looking after yourself is not self-indulgence, it's self-preservation, and that is an act of political warfare. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you very much, Dawn.